This is solo book review number five. This time it is Moonfleet by J. Mead Faulkner. This was also a watermill classic. It was 254 pages, and I was able to finish it in about one week. As always, I scored it each category out of 100, starting with characters. I gave it a 90 out of 100. The relationship between John Trenchard and Elsevier Block was really interesting. Very much like a father-son type of relationship over time. You watch the main character's love for Grace grow, even though they're distant from one another. His dislike for her father, Mr. Miskew. The legend of Blackbeard that is told over and over again and plays a part into the main story. Overall, the characters are relatable. The stories that are told between them make sense for the time period. And, you know, it's enjoyable to learn about these characters and hear their story. For the author's diction, I gave it an 80 out of 100. They tell about a diamond being stolen from King George I by Blackbeard, which ties into real historical characters. The way that he shows the main character's fear as a child when he's being told these stories, his curiosity, to look for the lost diamond, as well as the uh, descriptions that are told as far as the coast, the bay, the beach, the heavy winds, the storms, you know, it's very descriptive. And it seems like the author is telling the story from first person as if he is the main character looking back at his own life and speaking about the experiences that he had. It's very vivid in its descriptions. For the setting, I gave it a 90 out of 100. It takes place in 1757 in a small village off the coast of Southern England. Moonfleet, the name of the town, takes its name from the prominent family that owned the town back in the day. It's very windy, stormy. There's a lot of smugglers coming in and out. People running to the beach to get what they can from the ships that have crashed in these dangerous shores. The Mahoons, once again, was the family name that uh, started Moonfleet. Conflict, I gave it a 90 out of 100. The story begins with Elzevir's son being shot by Miskew. There's plenty of action in the story, whether it's the battles with the excise or with the guards in Holland, whether it's the contrabandiers trying to catch the people that are smuggling alcohols into the bay. The main character is also trapped in a crypt. He has to battle with starvation, darkness. Later on, there's a battle with the sea as a slave. And whether it's escaping the beach via cliff sides with a broken foot or the battle for the jewel in Carisbrook Castle, well, for resolution, I gave it a 90 out of 100. Once again, whether it's escaping the beach via cliff sides with a broken foot, the battle over the jewel in Carisbrook Castle near the well, or finally being returned to the riches that he is owed after the jeweler finally dies, long after being a slave, you know, the battle that is resolved. So even if it's not the way you wanted it to be resolved, it ends up being resolved. So that really hits you with a surprise. Speaking of surprises, I gave it an 80 out of 100 in the category of surprises because it's full of surprises. Whether it's the realization that the undead in the crypt was really just alcohol smugglers and the barrels of alcohol or the kegs of alcohol moving around in the crypt or that the jeweler lied about the diamond being fake or even at the end when they realized that the ship was back in Moonfleet Bay where they started in the beginning of the story. Plenty of surprises, surprise resolutions and the story taking unexpected turns. For knowledge, I also gave it an 80 out of 100. There was plenty of insight into the time period whether it being that alcohol cannot be sold by anyone other than the approved importers. So French wine is hidden from the officials when he comes by at the auction scene. There's also tons of religious references, Bible verses, and just overall cultural norms that come from religion. For symbolism, I gave it a 90 out of 100. Early on, it teaches that the Mahoons had a coat of arms that looks very much like a Y, but it is called a cross pal, which is a symbol that represents two roads in life that man must choose between. And they get deeper into that with a quote that I'll read a little bit later. Going down into the crypt, you know, that's very symbolic, maybe for the underworld, for the dark night of the soul, you know, going into the unknown in search of treasure as he's looking for Blackbeard's diamond, even laying on the dead body of Blackbeard and finding the message in the locket around his neck. You know, it's almost like he had to get so close to death in order to find what he was looking for, the treasure. I believe that symbolism shows up in many stories. The category of lessons, I gave it a 90 out of 100. Early on, the main character, John, his aunt, Jane, reminds him to live a very pious life. And she even says, what's bred in the bone will come out in the flesh, which is a quote that is a similar lesson to the picture of Dorian Gray, the previous book that I read, and even Frankenstein, right? Where the soul, it shows up in the body, you know, the sins that one man does 
it does show up later or people can tell, you know, in the face, in the eyes, the sins that someone has committed. You know, there's no hiding from the life that you live. Grace, who he's in love with, also tells him multiple times about the uh, diamond too. And I quote, have care how you touch the treasure. It was evilly come by and will bring a curse with it. And she says this to him way before he becomes a slave for 10 years, which was a result of the diamond itself. You know, he wouldn't let the diamond go. He had to get it back by breaking into the jeweler's home, which ends up with him becoming a slave for over 10 years. Him and his, you know, father figure, which is Elsevier Block. For the overall enjoyment of the story, I gave it an 85 out of 100. You know, the first person perspective of John Trenchard, it's relatable. You really get to know his inner conflicts, what he's thinking, what he's debating between, especially when he's healing, you know, he takes a wound at one point to the leg and he's just recovering in one of the like hideaways that they use for hiding alcohol and smuggling. You also get a look into the decisions he makes in the name of love or adventure, as well as the unique look at the time period, you know, the late 1700s. So I'm going to read a few quotes, you know, from the story. One of them is, as in life, so in a game of hazard, skill will make something of the worst throws. I believe this was introduced early on, you know, when they're carving the gravestone for Elsevier Block's actual son, who was killed in the very beginning, a smuggling, you know, by Mr. Miscue. And the other quote I'm going to read regards the cross pal. So like I said, the cross pal was a symbol that looks very much like a Y, but the distinction between a cross pal and the letter Y is mentioned in one of the church sermons by Mr. Glennie, who is the priest. They give another name for priest in this story, but it's basically like a priest. He's the one giving the sermon. It says, his discourse interested me, though I was only a boy, for he likened life to the letter Y, saying that in each man's life must come a point where two roads part like the arms of a Y, and that everyone must then choose for himself whether he will follow the broad and sloping path on the left or the steep and narrow path on the right. For, he said, if you will look in your books, you will see that the letter Y is not like the Mahoonies or the Mahoons cross pal with both arms equal but has the arm on the left broader and more sloping than the arm on the right hence ancient philosophers hold that this arm on the left represents the easy downward road of destruction and the arm on the right the narrow upward path of life it says when we heard that we all fell to searching our prayer books for a capital y and you know the proof is there i even opened up an old encyclopedia at my own house to check you know an old letter y to see if that was true and it is true you know if you open up any old book the capital capital letter Y has a much thicker symbol on the left side of the Y than it is on the right. And, you know, every symbol has a story behind it. That's very interesting that, you know, the letter Y is designed in this way, probably because of what the ancient philosophers would say. You know, it's a pathway. That really stuck with me. Another quote was a Bible verse or a Bible quote that was key to him finding the treasure. And this was when it says, the days of our age are three score years and 10. And though men be so strong that they come to four score years, yet is their strength then but labor and sorrow so soon passeth it away and we are gone and it says it is psalm xc.21 and you find out later in the story when he's speaking with the priest that that is the incorrect verse for that bible verse and that it ends up being a code for where the diamond is hidden so there's a lot of symbolism in the story a lot of hidden clues foreshadowing there's a point when he's a slave and he's actually branded with the letter y because the slave owner's name starts with a y but to him you know this symbol on his face ends up being a symbol of hope because it just means to him that the cross pal has branded him and he is just, you know, represents the Mahoon family where he's from, the Moonfleet, Blackbeard, you know, the, the Crips. So he's able to turn that symbol from being a slave branding into something more and a philosophy for his own life that ends up preserving his life. Overall, I would recommend this story to other people just because you know, it keeps you interested. It gives a lot of insight into the time period. The characters are relatable. It gets you wanting to learn more about the Crips and the history of the people in this story, of this small village off the coast of southern England, its relationships with other countries, with other groups of people. And, you know, it gives you hope. It, you see the relationship between this father figure and this son, even though they're not blood related, you know, it just grows over time. And, you know, in the end, it ends up being quite a love story. You know, when he's reunited with Grace, he names his first son Elsevier after this father figure who ends up saving his life at the end, sacrificing his life to save him from the uh, waves of the ocean at Moonfleet. And, you know, it really hits the heart. It's a great story. And teaches a lesson about this diamond. He, he ends up using it for good. He uses it to rebuild the town and ends up being a positive. You know, they say that even if a horrible sinner such as Blackbeard and his dying wish was to use this diamond for good. So you should never take that away, even from a sinner. If they want to use their money or their 
power that they have left for good, you know, it should be carried out. So adding up all the scores, you know, I come up with a solo score of 865 out of 1,000. So the final solo score is 865 out of 1,000. Once again, this was Moonfleet by J. Mead Faulkner. It was a watermill classic, and it was a great book. You know, I plan on continuing these watermill classics and eventually bringing another five solo book reviews. Thank you.